Um, lovely to see you all. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm joined by two, you know, amazing people today. Um, Dominic and Ash. Um, so Ash is at CERN, um, helping with the transfer office and making sure that we get more great scientists out into the world as founders. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, he's got so much experience to share with us today because he's been all the way around the world. <laughs> Australia, India, I think you've done America as well. Um, and now finally come to help us in Europe commercialize science better. So, you know, welcome and thank you. Um, and Davika. It's lovely to have you here too. Davika has also, you know, had a massive experience around the world at IBM Watson um, and also, you know, at university in America and has thankfully decided to come to the UK and help us commercialize and help scientists basically with their mindset to becoming entrepreneurs. So really about empowering them to look to the future and not just do research, but to come and build companies of impact. So I think, you know, we've got two great speakers and we can either go for uh, winter is coming or we could go for what we're working. I want for winter is coming. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, Game of Thrones fan, you know, I can, I can wing it. <laughs> um, or what we were going to talk about, which was how do we commercialise science better in Europe? Which is not the winter, that's like the spring is coming with science. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I feel like I've done your introductions, but I'd love to hand over to you both because I think you'll be able to say them much more eloquently than me. So, Ash, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, so, yeah, this is my fourth continent. Um, I'm originally Indian, grew up in India, went to the US, worked at University Tech Transfer, couple there, moved back to India, to Australia, now here. So my role at CERN is to look at a two, two, two aspects. One, how do we create more deep tech founders from CERN? The second aspect is how can we get certain technologies to startups so they can go to market faster. So that's the two big mandates that I'm working on. Fantastic. Devika. Of course. Um, Devika, I'm the co-founder of Willby. Uh, Willby.com, as we like to say. We serve entrepreneurial scientists end-to-end. Uh, -end. Uh, we do that through education, venture building, investment, and key operational support. We set up will be primarily at the back of the premise that science is going to solve the biggest challenges of the century and that scientists are the business leaders of our future, which is always one everyone has to think about. And if that is the case, then scientists are woefully underserved in Europe. So what can we do to change that? So everything that we've been building for the past two years has been aimed at empowering scientists to build healthy and viable companies and empowering the larger science ecosystem to make the healthy transition from academia to industry and the ones who remain in academia to at least have a commercial awareness um, whilst they're doing so. I've spent about 10 years before will be in the space of commercializing frontier technologies. Uh, as Izzy said, I did that with the Watson team at IBM. You can argue whether that was a good one or not, but it was certainly a very valuable experience uh, in New York and in London. And then I spent time working with the tech transfer office at Yale uh, during my MBA. Uh, and I think both were very valuable and kind of driving towards doing what we're doing now at Willby. Thank you. So Ash, you joined Sun in 2019, I believe. Yes. Um, what was it like when you got there? Was it a bit of a shock to the system after some of the other countries you'd been to? And what have you implemented so far? Right. Um, so, you know, when you said 2019, I had to actually think that was pre-COVID. That was a different life. Um, but yeah, it, it, was, it was a cultural shock a little bit, you know. Um, but for me, CERN was so different. And what attracted me to CERN was the whole concept is how do we give technology faster outside, right? So we don't take equity in startups. Our licensing terms are phenomenally fast, not fast, uh, under 5%, under 2%, sometimes mostly free. We are proponents of open source systems. So we, if you put all of CERN together, we have 18 patents. And that's it. Patent is a really bad word within CERN. So we really give stuff out. Um, 
what was challenging was two fronts. One, people didn't know that we had all these amazing stuff, and B, they didn't think that startups can work with CERN. You needed to be a bigger company. So we kind of wanted to break that ethos. Um, what have we implemented? Right now, we're looking more on the metrics, not a number of startups, not a number of licenses, but more on how fast can I execute it. I don't have to touch every contract. It should be shrink-wrapped. I don't have to negotiate each licensing deal. This is the tech you build, you take, go do faster. And I want to be measured on things that we are responsible, not to saying this startup raised a billion dollars. I had nothing to do with it. I don't want to claim credit to it. And that's the founders doing it. What we did was gave the technology, enable the founders to go to market faster. And that's it. So is to change the mindset. I'm going to use the word quite a bit, and so are you. So I went first. Um, is the mindset you know, from within CERN to saying it's not the technology that should disappear in the background because CERN knows technology and always was the forefront of it, but focus on the founder who are taking the risk and focus on helping them. Um, so it took three years to get the movement. October, we're launching the program, so uh, excited about it. It's great. And Davika, you've obviously similar sort of timing. It was just yeah. before COVID, 2020. What, like, what did you feel was the big gap in the UK that you needed to fill and were addressing? Um, so I think when we, when we started 2019, 2020, we spent a lot of time on the ground speaking with many, many folks in the ecosystem, you know, scientists from postdocs, professors, PIs, PhDs, tech transfer offices, venture capital. And we found that contrary to popular belief, the biggest hurdle in commercializing science was not access to capital, but it was the lack of confidence and knowledge, business knowledge on part of the researchers. And if you like, the talent behind the research is the scientists, and if you don't empower the scientists, then how can we ever expect to see more companies being commercialized, irrespective of whether the scientist plays the role of the founder or not? And that's somehow been missed across ecosystems, not just in the UK, but I'd say globally it's been missed. So we said, what if we could give the practical tools uh, to scientists who understand the language of science very well, because they've been doing it for 10, 15, 20 years, but help them understand the language of business, then they would have agency and power to make more informed decisions with their careers. It's education. I mean, knowledge is power. So we started with that. Uh, we were lucky that we had anchor partners of Imperial Oxford and Cambridge to begin with. And we did a, you know, we did a trial course, and from there we've expanded. In fact, we have you know, Rhinus has done a course with us. Uh, we have partnerships with Tartu and uh, Taltech and universities in Germany, hopefully CERN, sure. uh, and, <laughs> and, um, and, 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 and several more. So I think for us it was, let's empower scientists to make better decisions in pursuing any path beyond academia. And in that process, the ones who end up going towards commercializing, they'd be better informed, they avoid making stupid mistakes. Um, and uh, for the rest, you're basically opening up a, up a path for 99.5% of researchers who don't end up becoming tenured uh, professors. So tell us a little bit about the program. Like, what's the, what's the, the, the key topics that you think are most valuable? Um, so Every, uh, so, so we run a bunch of programs now. I think our flagship one is focused on empowering scientists and in particular postdocs, because we think postdocs are you know, even more underserved in, in the universe of uh, science. Uh, and if you're not too familiar, you know, postdocs are employed researchers by, you know, from the university, which is different to master's students, undergrads, and often as PhDs as well. Um, and the whole, we run these over four weeks. Uh, we have a couple of fellows here as well, so you can ask them questions post, uh, you know, uh, post the panel. Um, the whole focus is on two things. One is what's the mindset shift that you need as a researcher to move from a scientist to a founder? And then the second is how can you think about your research as a product? Uh, and and that's, that's all we're doing. We're only talking about mindset, and the people who are talking are all people who've done it before. So experienced and exited science founders, investors, 
and, uh, and operators. So none of the stuff on like lean business model canvas and like all these tools and frameworks, I think, thank God I did my MBA because I took the, the best and the worst of it. Uh, but it's all entirely focused on the talent um, behind, the, behind the research and, and helping them understand do, do they want to have what it takes? Do they have what it takes? And then what should be the best route for them post course? Yeah. course? And what have you both seen in terms of appetite from academics and PhDs to actually want to be founders? Because it feels like there's a major shift and we are heading finally in the way of the US where if you walk around the halls, they're not talking about their research. They're actually talking about a company and pitching you like, have we, have we made that shift? Is that happening? CERN has some of the unique you know, problems associated with the challenges, right? So we have a golden handcuff that so most people who come to CERN are indoctrinated that you come as a fellow, you become a staff, you get an indefinite contract, and you retire from CERN. So that's the path that people look up to, right? And then suddenly my job is to say, hey, why don't you quit your job and do a startup? Um, when I came in, you know, the existing dogma was nobody will ever quit their jobs, nobody will ever do startups, you're wasting your time, you kind of was a bad hire that was kind of employed. Um, so what I did was went and asked alumni who are at a series A, B stage to saying, you know, if you rewind time, what would you have liked to be at CERN? And the overwhelming answer was, we had examples of scientists, Nobel laureates, data scientists, engineers, but I never met an entrepreneur at CERN, ever. Right? And so the first one I reached out to was an Estonian CERN alumni. His name is Mate Munzel, founder of Linguist. He came, you know, talked through from his perspective of what was missing. And, and now we have close to about six or seven people who are at different stages of spinning out their research. Um, some of them are staff who have been given an extension in their contract and they said no, which is like a shock to the system. I was like, oh my God, that guy is a staff. He's quitting his job to do his startup. And people kind of, there's still, the bigger challenge is that they still look there as traitors. You're leaving science to go to business. That mentality is still there, but we wanted at least a few, you know, runs on the board where we can go back and say, look, he can do it, so, so can you. Uh, that representation is not there, but it's slowly getting momentum, building around that is where we're putting all our energy on. And Tafika, you must find it slightly different in the UK because I mean, if you go to Oxford, Imperial, or Cambridge now, uh, they've seen the successes of other yeah. academics, researchers, PhDs, and are all quite hungry for that. But, you know, how are you finding the shift? Yeah, it's, you're right. I think there's this, at least in the UK, there's this tendency now to over-rotate on entrepreneurship almost, uh, which also is not necessarily the mindset that, you know, we think is, is the best one. There's this whole continuum you know, between academia and entrepreneurship, which has a whole set of meaningful roles that need to be fulfilled as well within science commercialization. And so we're finding that so we have a, a community of about 130 scientists or science commercialization stakeholders that we've trained now over the past two years. It'll be about 20% who are going and building companies. And we know that have conviction that they can do it and they'll do it really well. But there's this balance which is suddenly excited about joining a startup, becoming founding team members, when earlier they probably did not even have, they probably thought that it's academia or you know, joining Big Pharma uh, or Shell or something like that. So there's all these new parts, or VC, for example, or tech transfer, for example. So there are these new parts that, are, that need to be fulfilled, and I think the only way the commercialization infrastructure and ecosystem as a whole will change is if you know, everyone is enabled to pursue all of these rather than everyone doing, uh, becoming entrepreneurs, if you like. So that's an interesting change and shift I think we'll see um, in some of the more mature, let's say, uh, UK or US. Yeah. What do you think is our biggest challenge still? Um, so from a European perspective, I find so many fragmentation, right? So if I compare to US, you know, it doesn't matter whether, you know, you are a company in California trying to sell in Texas, you don't have to set up a new company. But if you're a French startup trying to set up uh, something in Germany, you have to go through the entire bureaucracy of moving and going to another, another market. 
Um, and plus, every ecosystem is very locally focused, right? And so for me, that lack of mentorship, lack of somebody to go reach out to, that network is also fragmented because of those borders. You know, I, you're from the French speaking area of Switzerland, you're from the German speaking area. Uh, I find it fascinating that, you know, within a country of 8 million, there are 20 different fractions, right? Um, and the biggest challenge I see is like, even from folks from CERN, when I introduce them to EPFL to talk with somebody doing applied work, like, that's so far away. I like 60 kilometers. I moved 15,000 kilometers to come to CERN, right? So it kind of, that mindset doesn't, doesn't compute for me. Um, but where I see challenge, uh, you know, opportunities are now when, when people move out their research, they also seek out who do I talk to. Before, that was not available in a way, you know, folks like Wilbe, where they connect other folks from, you know, UK to somebody in Spain, somebody in Italy, that they, they never got a talk before, right? And so that is super fascinating and interesting. How can we supercharge those connections um, is what I'm excited about. Devika, what are you mm. still thinking needs to be addressed? So much. <laughs> <laughs> so what? I mean, I say the the biggest the biggest one, of course, which I, which we've already spoken about, is empowering the scientists, but also the overall ecosystem on the power of science. I think COVID has helped in educating a lot of people about the power of science. Um, the second, which Ash spoke about, and I think uh, CERN and what he's building is an anomaly uh, in the ecosystem, is just uh, the lack of a straightforward process of actually spinning out technology. Um, from institutions, so and science companies are very unique because they have IP usually involved, uh, and it's stemming from research, and they're all from university. So unfortunately, science founders and science companies they almost die a thousand deaths even before they've started building a company because they have to go through this long process of getting their stuff out of university, and that's often takes one to two years on average, mm -hmm. which is shocking. And then you have universities that, um, you know, can take, uh, and Izzy knows this very well, they can take up to 70% of your company, which does not necessarily make it exciting for any venture capitalist to come on board after that, and tie the hands of the, uh, I, I can see, I'm glad you're shocked by that. Exactly, it is shocking. <laughs> it, that's what we're fighting for, yeah. <laughs> it is shocking. Um, and tie the hands of, uh, of the founders. So I think that's another big challenge. Um, and you know, we're thinking of ways to solve that. Is it enabling the tech transfer ecosystem? Um, or is it you know, coming up with rule books, which is what Ash is doing, of coming up with a very straightforward process of spinning out uh, the technology? And I think the third piece is we still have, like, I think, a dichotomy of investors. So, and you can speak more to this actually yourself, because yeah. um, Izzy runs her fund. And, um, we have the traditional investors who like working with the tech transfer offices. They like the unfriendly terms. They depress valuations. They may not see the potential of the technology. And then you have a new set of investors who do um, understand it. We just need more, more, more of more new investors investing in the in the space. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I had one last question before I would love to open it up for questions. So do get your thinking caps on for a few good questions. But um, what about US VCs coming in? Like good, bad, because they're coming in earlier. Obviously, a uh, love for the deep tech and our great science and technology here. What do we think towards this? Is this good for the ecosystem or is it bad? You go first. Or go next. So, you know, we've just, um, our three most recent companies, they've either been led by or seen participation from US uh, VCs, uh, and they're all great VCs. So I think if you're operating under the rules of capitalism, whoever moves most effectively is going to, uh, is going to capture the demand, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Uh, though that said, so the advantages are VCs from the US move quicker. It takes a lot longer for European VCs to actually do due diligence and say yes or no. And, and you know, we, I think we need to improve upon that uh, as an ecosystem. The nice thing is that you are seeing a new crop of European venture capital firms coming up, interested in deep tech, supporting science. 
And they actually have an advantage because they're on the ground, so they can actually help the founders build up companies versus a lot of these investors who come here because they're seeing exciting research, but they're also seeing lower valuations, but they're not really there to help grow the company. So their natural position is, you know, let's move you to the US uh, once you do your Series A or as you do your Series A, which doesn't necessarily have to be, have to be the case. It could, it could still happen, uh, but you could very well grow, grow the company here too. I agree. Ash, what are you saying? So, look, we are a European research lab. Our, you know, we're funded by member states in Europe. We want to have a lot more startups in Europe. That being said, right now, all the inbounds we've had from venture capital has all been the American guys, right? They know two things they do well in, you know, um, with the caution of generalization. Um, they're very good at self-promotion and very good at promoting others, right? And so when I get a, U, you know, a US venture guy, it's like, okay, look, I don't like this startup, but I've got all of these other startups, what can you help? So it's that mega networking that comes with it. Um, where do I see? I would love for more deep tech VCs in Europe investing in and keeping those startups here. But right now, when you are don't have the options uh, and the startups need the money, I'm not going to be picky to saying that, ah, oh, it's US money. Money is good and, and the startups need it. So um, we would love a lot more of deep tech VCs based in, the, based in Europe invest in stuff that comes out of research labs here in, in Europe. But right now, it's you know, I mean, it, it's a 5x or 6x difference on how much inbound I'm getting from um, European-based firms and UK. I don't think you, so a lot of UK firms as well reach out. And then the US one. So for me, shift towards more to the, uh, the Europe ones. But right now, a lot of US firms are investing, so which is good. Either way, it will create competition. Hopefully, more deal flow happens. I think it will change. I think there's more deep tech. Uh, European deep tech funds, the LPs, I think, are waking up to, mm. well, deep tech and, and, and Europe is a good place to be. So I'm hoping we can continue to, to grow fabulously large, scalable deep tech companies. Um, any questions from the audience? We've got about five. Oh, yes, great, a hand. I go first, and you know she's the more educator. Um, so, so for me, you know, I always go historical, right? So, if you look at, you know, I, my question is, why is Silicon Valley called Silicon, right? It all started with Fairchild Semiconductors, the treacherous eight who left and created, you know, Fairchild Semiconductors, and that's where the whole semiconductor industry came from. The eight people include the guys who went and founded Intel after that. Right, and these were actual scientists who took the leap because they understood the tech. You can't go tell somebody who's never seen a transistor before to tell how a transistor works. You invented the damn thing, so you have to do it, right? And so historically, we've always had deep tech entrepreneurs who are scientists at heart, who are engineers at heart who build it, right? And if you look now, more historically, everything, you know, even the chap was talking about Solugen, where two scientists who, who spun it out. Europe, where we don't have enough is, we don't celebrate the scientists who are actually doing science entrepreneurship, right? We have unicorns, we have a lot of focus on all of the other technologies or other products that come out, but never glorifying the science behind it. I mean, as a geek, I would like, you know, scientists being put on the front page. Um, you know, we talk about bio and tech. Can anyone name the guys who actually created the vaccine? Right? And that's my point, right? And so we need to focus more on the scientists behind it, how they've actually transitioned and become an entrepreneur and the challenges associated with it, right? Um, your, your question, how do you encourage the scientists to become an entrepreneur? My simple question is, you understand the science, you developed it, you've done the hard work. For you to understand cap table is easy, <laughs> rather than telling a lawyer how to do science. Yeah. yeah. Great, great closing. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Um, we, um, 
wholeheartedly agree on the on the la on the last piece Ash said like as scientists you already have a superpower I mean understanding the language of business is so easy if you have the inclination to do so and if you do have the inclination to do so which means raw curiosity then it's like a double superpower which is unmatched by I think any other any regular uh, non-scientist if you like which is me um, we, so you said selling entrepreneur, how do you sell entrepreneurship to a scientist? That was the thing. Actually, the first thing we do is we don't sell entrepreneurship at all. In fact, the number one thing we say when we start any class is this is not a cohort. You don't all have to become entrepreneurs and you're not being forced to start a company. And I think trust is so important with while creating any relationship, but certainly, uh, certainly among scientists as well. They've been, you know, locked within their silo of research for, for so many years, and you're now introducing them to a whole new la language. So a lot of our focus, therefore, is helping them understand what that language is, and then helping them understand where they fit there, rather than speaking at scientists and, and you know, saying, this is what you should be uh, doing. So the decision should come from, from within, if you like. I know that sounds very soft and fuzzy, but soft skills are the hardest ones to, to, to address. All right. Thank yeah. you. One final question. Oh, yes. Speech. So let's uh, crunch this question, 70% uh, stake. Uh, Hearing that, we can only imagine possibly what the universities and science uh, institutions' uh, excuses are for this. But in your experiences, what are the key like uh, reasons that uh, institutions uh, go with uh, that uh, large equity stake uh, to get the company out from the university? So what are like the key three reasons they, or excuses they are bringing up to take the 70% of equity? Oh. Well, I can start from a VC Please. perspective <laughs> on that one. Um, I mean, I just don't think they get it. <laughs> and I don't think they get that these companies are totally unfundable. And then they want us to go negotiate. And it's like, we don't have 12 months, 18 months to negotiate. So those poor founders that are doing actually really interesting things just get completely killed off our pipeline because we just cannot spend the time. Um, I think, you know, in the UK, I think it's like historical. I think it's greed. I think it's just the way they feel that it's been done. I think there's just a number of issues which they just don't address. Um, obviously, the ones you're working with, Davika, and we work with are, are, are pretty good now. Um, but that's taken a long time. Yeah. Yeah, they, they're getting better. I think there's still <laughs> yeah, a, lot of, a lot of room. I, I think it's fundamentally universities some of the universities, not just in the UK, I think this is a, you know, a global, certainly, uh, feel that, you know, the, I think they get conflicted with the mission. Usually you would imagine the university's mission is to do research and create impact for society. Um, and after all, a lot of them are also funded by taxpayers' money, so it, it, you know, it should be that. But I think some of the universities get conflicted by saying, ooh, you know, we're seeing so much, there's potentially so much value here, so we can play the role not just of educators uh, and creating great research, but we could also uh, be the ones owning the IP. We could also be the ones owning the companies. We could also be the ones investing in the company. And, uh, and then suddenly you're creating four walls around the researchers, uh, which they then have to crack open in order to actually enter a system that operates under the rules of capitalism. Um, which is which is not this if you take that that approach. Uh, so I'd say the, the 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 some of the best examples are Stanford and MIT. They have a very and of course Ash. Nah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so for me, I think there's a KPI problem, right? If you measure number of startups or number of patents or amount of money you generate in a tech transfer office, that goes into a virtual cycle. Oh, you ra you got. 20 million in royalties last year. Why are you not getting 25 million this year? So you end up squeezing the next deal to saying, yes, I need extra you know, equity, extra royalty in every deal. 
because then you game the system on the KPI being revenue. If it is KPI being number of patents, you file every damn thing under the sky. So rather, if the KPI for any tech transfer is on NPS score, how fast did you execute, then you will see a significant change because your main customer is the researcher. They are your customer, not you know the venture capitalist, not the equity that you raise. You need to service your researcher, right? And so that's where the mind shift on tech transfer should be on how do I serve my customer, which are the postdocs, the po professors, oh, they're so hard to deal with, but then that's why you give a service. Um, but the service mentality is not there, and then you optimize all of the other KPIs, and then that leads to, oh, I want to have a Google, just like Stanford, because they made 396 million. Why am I not getting a Google? So then it kind of feeds up into the whole, let's, let's, let's optimize for money on every deal. I think that's where the shift should happen. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, my guests. Ash, Devika, brilliant insights. Thank you. Thank you.